apparently there's a lot of um, amazing experience up here on the stage with these guys. They are both uh, studio owners, and they and yeah, they both have been doing this for a long time, and we're just really excited. I think I'll start with Joey. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your yourself and your studio? Sure. Um, I'm Joey. Um, Joey Gerwin. I've. Uh, I'm the owner operator um, of Orange Studio Recording in Grandview. Um, I've done lots of work both with local bands, regional bands, national bands, international bands. Um, I started off just recording in my house like many of us do and sort of slowly grew my way into becoming an accidental studio owner. Um, I've uh, I was nominated for a Grammy in 2019 for my work on uh, Seen Kuti's record, Black Times. Um, have done a bunch of uh, audio restoration work with uh, the Analog Africa and Awesome Tapes from Africa labels. Um, am also a educator and just a guy who goes on walks and hangs out with deer a lot. So. Awesome, thank you. Keith? Hey, I'm Keith Allen. I uh, am co-owner with Amy at Secret Studio. I've been a musician my entire life, pretty much since single digits. And as an adult, played in Athens and Columbus uh, in various bands. Uh, and uh, about, I've always done recording in one capacity or another, studied audio production at Ohio University. And then, uh, about 10 years ago, I started working at Musical Recording, oldest studio in Columbus, vinyl record pressing there, analog stuff, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then uh, on, oh, I don't know, what, three years ago, Amy and I started Secret Studio. We had our opening, grand opening party on March 13th, 2020, wow, which wow. was canceled that day. And uh, But since then, you know, we've, we've made it through and we're, uh, we're I've worked with a lot of artists in, in Columbus and some national, international as well, but no Grammys yet. I'll get Me there. either. Me either. Oh well, no nominations yet. And you both, uh, <laughs> you both teach at OU. Yeah, we uh, are. Do you we do the both... same thing at OU? Do you both teach the similar? Uh, we we teach different courses at OU. Uh, I teach uh, the advanced uh, digital mixing techniques. And Keith teaches music and technology production too. It's more They're very smart. It's, it's They're very smart, sexy professor. Academic words. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, well, I know that there's going to be a lot of questions, so we're going to save time, a lot of time for your questions, because I know you do have them. Um, but like, I think we just wanted to pick your brains tonight about, like, how did you first of all, how did you start? How did you get to recording, and how did you start uh, recording yourself or others? How did that happen for both of you? Uh, so I started recording when I got a, a Walkman as a Hanukkah present when I was six years old. And um, I would sneak out of my bedroom at night and dub records onto, onto cassettes so I could listen to them in my Walkman. And then at some point I figured out that I could plug the headphones into the microphone jack of this amplifier and like yell into them and record onto tapes. So that's how I started recording. Um, I, I honestly, I was also, you know, I was a musician. I hung out with a, a lot of musicians. Um, we would mess around with a lot of like four track stuff when we were, when we were younger. Um, I was really into tape trading, um, like trading bootleg tapes a whole lot when I was when I was a kid, um, and I I was like recording just sort of like four track stuff or like stuff in Audacity at you know at band practices and stuff like that, and I just started getting like enough gear to get away with being able to do the minimal amount of stuff that I thought that I needed to do, um, and then started recording demos and stuff for other bands at my house, 
and I eventually kind of outgrew that and had to find a studio to do that stuff in, and that's sort of how it started. How, what does your studio name mean? <laughs> that is the most frequently asked question. Um, so Orange Judio came from, uh, we knew this uh, person who was a marketing student or something like that, and um, and she said that if you name uh, your company or your brand or whatever and you associate it with a color, that it'll stick in somebody's mind better and, th and they will be better able to remember it. We have this ball, uh, Baldwin, uh, this orange Baldwin piano, but we couldn't call it Orange Studio because uh, that's Kayampa's studio. <laughs> and, um, and I think uh, we were out, uh, went to went to Nam, and there's like there was the orange Julius is everywhere on the West Coast, and if we can't call it Orange Studio, we just went with Orange Judio, and it was a total temporary name. Like we're totally going to change this when we think of something better, and it's been 15. It's years. great. It's a great name. Because <laughs> I'm I know a lot of people want to know what it means. So it's cool. Now Thank you, you know. for sharing. Um, and we're going to get back to you here in a minute about how to start uh, things in your house, but tell us about your experience. Okay, my experience, uh, I was very lucky to have the older sibling who turns you on to great music if you have an older, older sibling that has done that. And so he's also a fantastic jazz musician, sax player, and arranger. And, uh, so I got a lot of input from him. And my dad worked for RCA. Nothing sexy at all. He was a manager at a plant that produced, well, the sexy part, tubes. Uh, but when that plant closed in New Jersey, we moved to Ohio, and um, he was still working for RCA, but it was for making picture tubes for old televisions and stuff. But he was just a manager. He wasn't a creative musician at all, but he had a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. And uh, my friends and I just would start messing around with that, uh, recording fake radio shows and, and things, you know, just stupid stuff. But then, you know, when we started playing music together, we, we would just, we actually ended up, we bought a, a PA mixer for our band, and one guy had a cassette player and I had a cassette player, and so we would record the band playing to a cassette, with like two mics through this mixer to a cassette, and play the cassette back through the mixer and record it again and do our vocals. And that's what we did in high school. Uh, obviously before computers. So, uh, you know, then getting into four tracks and, and things like that. That's awesome. Didn't you also used to go out and record things in the wild when you were a little kid? Did you tell me that story? I did. I did. Like you used to go out at night and... Yeah, there's, yeah, I can okay, remember I a couple times I did that. <laughs> thought you did that? Okay. Um, it wasn't a thing, though. Okay, um, so <laughs> you guys started somewhere, and now you're at a different place with your career. So can we, um, out here, can we get a hands up? Is anybody, like, looking to start their own home recording studio area? Is that why you're, I mean, I know there's different mo motivations, but, um, yeah. So for these guys especially, what is like the bare minimum, like you can both just kind of talk, free talk, but what do you need? Like you need a room, you need soundproofing, you need, you know, what it, what could you get by with, how much money could you, you know, the basics you could spend? I know you yeah. can spend, listen, I did not know about how much this stuff costs until I started having this business with him. So expensive, like so expensive. So let's talk about basics. I mean, though. yeah, there's a range, right? Yeah. You know, like it depends what your goal is. Yeah, it, it really, yeah, that's, that's probably the most frequently asked question that, that I get. How much is it going to cost? What should I buy? And I think that it, it really does depend on what your goals are and what, what you're trying to, to accomplish. I think it also depends on, like, what kind of musician you are and what, how, are you a technical person or are you not a technical person? It, it really does, and you know, are you planning on, you know, are you trying to, you know, mix at home because that's a, you know, that's a whole different situation. Um, are, you know, is your goal just to, 
uh, yeah, record, you know, quick demos of your, you know, of yourself? Are you trying to, you know, just produce beats and have like a single vocal going on? So there's, it, it feels like a, uh, a, a can of worms of a, you know, to answer that question. I would say that the, the thing that you like, you know, at bare minimum, <laughs> you need assuming that, so computers have made home recording much, uh, much more uh, feasible. You know, the, uh, the, the, the cost of entry is way lower than it was when, you know, you needed, an, you know, a eight track tape machine or, you know. Um, so assuming that uh, you're using a computer, at the very minimum, you're going to need something that turns, you know, pluses and minuses into ones and zeros. So you're going to need an interface um, so your com computer can communicate. And then uh, you're going to need something to listen to those, you know, those those ones and zeros once they're turned back, you know, into, into audio. So you're going to need either speakers or headphones. Um, you're going to need something to input. Um, so if it's a, you know, if it's a microphone, if you're recording stuff in a space, then you're probably going to need a microphone to capture that sound or, you know, something to plug in direct if you're just, you know, playing guitar or a MIDI controller if you're staying entirely in the box, as we say. So it's a really, like, broad answer that I could, I could go any sort of direction. What if it's like total, just, I don't know what I'm doing, but I want to sing some songs. I'm a songwriter. I just want to record. Like, could you get away with like for a grand? Is it, like, is that, is that, what is the ballpark for like basic, 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 if you just want to like start? People yeah. want to know that. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, uh, you can less than a grand for sure. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're just acoustic guitar and, and singing, um, you know, and you have a computer, then you got, you know, if you have a Mac, you've got GarageBand. If you have a PC, you can get uh, Audacity for free or Reaper for not much. And um, I mean, I'll just say that I was never more creative and spontaneous uh, compared to like, oh, like, the, the most creative and spontaneous I was as a recording person at home was having one of these short SM58 microphones and a four-track cassette. That's that's like I I got ideas out. I didn't have to deal with a computer and all this stuff. So like a laptop with a program and a small interface for two hundred bucks uh, and a hundred dollar microphone will start you. What's the like curve? The learning curve of I mean, because I sit here and I, and behind the scenes, know, like, I mean, we have this, like, long board with all these sliders. I mean, there's so much equipment. Board and sliders. Board. Yeah. Long board with sliders. Yeah, we have so much equipment and it's so crazy and, like, I don't even know what's happening. I can only play Spotify through that. I don't know. It looks so crazy. So, what's the learning curve for, like, even on a basic level with a computer and, like, one of these programs? So, I... I tell, and I tell this to our students at, at OU, and I also uh, tell this to my interns at the studio, that recording is something that you can learn how to, I liken it to chess or poker. Like, I can teach a person how to, how all the, how all the pieces move on a chess board in an hour, yeah. less than an hour but you are going to be spending the rest of your life learning how to do that thing. I can teach you how to play poker in five minutes. You are going to spend the rest of your life, if that's what you want to do, um, being a better poker player. And so I can, you know, the learning curve upon entry is not, you know, I mean, it's really not as com complex as we often make it, you know, it's, you know, taking sound and printing it somewhere, um, you know? But it's those nuances that people don't, like like how to mic things and how, like all that learning, that's a lot of learning too. Yeah, yeah. certainly. And uh, you're gonna do it wrong sometimes yeah. and that's okay. Yeah. Like the other thing that I always tell people is you suck at everything you do when you first do it. Like. 
I sucked at walking when I first attempted to walk. <laughs> I fell on my face over and over and over again until I was able to walk. You suck at piano, you suck at guitar, you suck at all these things when you first, when you first try. And you learn through a process of failure and not allowing that failure to, um, to keep you from trying it again. And that's how anybody gets better at anything. It's just through, like, knowing, like, acknowledging, yeah, I sucked at that that time. I'm going to do it again. And just persevere through the suck. <laughs> Quote me on that, please. <laughs> persevere through the suck. Um, do you have any, like hot tips for people in general like okay I like this piece of equipment I like this microphone I mean do you have like things that you really love for home and also what if you just like have a closet and is there something you can do for soundproofing like these are all probably things people would like to know like how can you set it up too well um so so my background is more of, of live music uh not so much like MIDI and and things like that. although I've, I've done a lot of that too um my, I tend to go really experimental with with my uh, ambient drone music, but um, I, over the years I've recorded in living rooms, I've recorded in basements, I've recorded uh, in so many different spaces and houses I've rented, and, and uh, it took me a really long time to kind of like figure out how to do this. I think my first hot tip is Hot tip. Hot tip. Get somebody else to do it if you're playing. Yeah. At least for a while. Because I have records I made. They're out there. And I play drums on them. And, make, and, and I did not do my best engineering. And I did not do my best playing drums on them. Uh, because I was spread too thin. And so the tempo speed up on a few songs. And... I had to do a lot of editing on some things, and you know, maybe, yeah, there's just, yeah, there's there's just lots of, I think I finally, like, it took me, you know, like, quite a while, like, a, a good, like, for as far as home recording, like, a good, like, eight, ten years to really, like, nail it in my, in my mind. Um, I'm sure, I, you know, I've, yeah, I've recorded in garages, and so many different spaces so like trying to get the um you know the acoustical environment to sound good uh is huge it's like number one um you know you can kind of correct for bad mic placement sometimes but if what you're putting in and the environment you're recording in doesn't sound good then it's not gonna be good once you record it i'm uh the, i i that like dovetail, dovetail, dovetails perfectly into what uh, my hot tip number two. Hot tip. Uh, hot tip. Um, hot tip number two is um, that assume like, and this goes specifically, I think for for microphone, like when people are buying microphones for home recording, that's probably one of the most common. Like, what microphone should I get at home? And. Um, Especially for home recording, you should be choosing your equipment on what it is not recording just as much as what it is recording. Um, I have, like, so many times had, um, had uh, like, vocal takes that, that I got from somebody recording at home, and they're like, I don't understand. I spent, you know, $10,000 on a 251, and I'm in the, you know... And like a more expensive microphone is just like, especially if your room does not sound good. And most home record, most student, like most of our home recording environments, they're not designed to be recording environments. You know, you're in an apartment that has a bunch of like square rooms with parallel walls and, you know, pretty low ceilings. Like they're not always, I we're not always in ideal environments. And if you, you know, if you put a $10,000 microphone and, and record in a non-ideal environment, it's just going to put a microscope on, oh, this was clearly not recorded in an ideal <laughs> environment. Um, and so, um, 
Uh, managing your room, as, as Keith said, making your environment as ideal as, as ideal as possible, and then making your microphone selection that are going to uh, play to your strengths and, you know, kind of, you know, reject or minimize uh, some of the imperfections that might exist environmentally. What, what can people use to soundproof their room? And if you had a house, so if you had a house, where do you put the studio? The ideal place. Well, there's a difference between soundproofing and sound treatment. He said it so Hot I didn't tab. have to. He said it so I didn't have to. Yeah. So yeah, soundproofing is expensive. Uh, it it is you know getting the outside sounds from you know keeping them from coming inside. Um, but sound you know the acoustics in your room, the, the sound treatments in your room, like. Joey referred to earlier, parallel walls, low ceilings, you get a lot of standing waves or just like weird reflections in your room and they'll pick up on the mic. And so uh, treating the room appropriately is, is, is different than like keeping the sound out. Um, I don't know if you want to... No, I, I, I'm glad that you, you, you chimed in on that. Um, and yeah, I think that everything it's it's so dependent on your goals you know if if you have if you are you know a person that is living in a three bedroom home all by yourself and don't care about like sacrificing having a living room so you can have a place to record drums you know sure um, like I would prefer to track drums probably in the largest room of the house um, and that's part of half the reason why I ended up having to, you know, start my own studio because you can only tell your girlfriend so many times, "Hey, can I walk the? Can I have you walk the dog for like six hours because we're, <laughs> we're tracking drums?" Um, and so I think that um, it it's really really dependent. The one thing that I would say is that wherever you're going to work, you want you want to. Um, look at what the problem areas are in that room. And every room has different problem areas. Um, and you're going to find, uh, you know, some rooms are like really, really ringy because, you know, the, the reflections are, are all weird. So you're going to uh, use a combination of things that absorb and things that, that scatter the sound, you know, you know, uh, you know a combination of diffusion and absorption to try to control that a little bit. I always, uh, I always tell people that if they imagine a sound that they're creating as a handful of ping pong balls, and the goal is to not have the ping pong ball come right back at you. And there's two ways to do that. You can throw it against something that is gonna absorb the energy of the ping pong ball, and it just, it's just going to fall to the ground. Or you can do something that is going to scatter the direction in which it, uh, you know, reflects back. And so that is diffusion. If I throw, you know, if I throw a ping pong ball up against a bookshelf with a whole bunch of, you know, scattered objects, the chances of it coming back at me directly are much less likely than if it's a flat wall. I love that analogy. And um, we, when you mentioned bookshelf, uh, one of the things that I started to do, because I didn't have a lot of money, and maybe I had an interface and a computer and a couple mics, I was using what I had in the house to diffuse and to absorb. So bookshelves are really good for a diffusing sound. Uh, you know, laundry baskets, I don't know. You can come up with so many yeah, different I, things. Too, I, like. I got a bunch of those... Uh, a bunch of typeset drawers uh, from like old printing presses that you can, you know, usually buy at like, you know, a antique shop for 20 bucks a piece and put a whole bunch of those on the wall behind my listening position and yeah. kind of use those as, as diffusion, so. Because you can put different lengths for each drawer. And yeah. Out. Yeah. So they all, all the sound will hit these different spots and reflect it at different spots so it diffuses it out. The other thing though, that's we were just talking in that example about the sound of the instruments in the room, but there's also the listening over your monitors 
in a room, which is just as important. Um, you know, some rooms will emphasize bass frequencies and will sound really boomy, and some uh, rooms will, you know, em emphasize other frequencies that might affect how you mix. Um, so I, I try to get a handle on that, but also have really good um, reference songs, popular music, something that you're very familiar with in a style that you know, something that you can listen to against yours and say, oh, in this room, you know, this sounds bright. Uh, well, you know, then I, I got to make sure that I'm not going to make this sound too bright. Uh, you know, or, I don't know what that means. You say that all the time. What's right. that mean? Yeah. I'm not a musician, if no one knew that. I'm the creative side of this uh, industry. Yes. I'm not a musician, so it's like fascinating to me. Like, what does that mean, bright? Treble uh, versus bass. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and there is actually not a producer that I don't... There's not a producer that I know that doesn't have the one song when they're going into an unfamiliar room, the song that they know, like the back of their hand, in their sleep, and they know exactly how it sounds, and then when they listen to that song in a new environment, they're like, oh, bass is slightly more represented in this room. And so I have a question for What's you. What's your song? What's your song? <laughs> Karma Police by, the ra by Radiohead. Ow. Good one. Good one. It's a good one. Especially at the break where this is what you get. Like, if you, yes. especially if you go off, like, the actual CD or lossless versus, like, an MP3, like, you can hear, oh, just like his voice, you can hear the back of his throat on that, and um, that's so that's my remedy. Human nature, Michael Jackson. Uh, I didn't I didn't write it, but it is. Um, okay, so I really want to get I want to do questions, a lot of questions, but I also do want two more things. So when you're setting up the room and you're if it's bright or whatever, like also is it a lot of tinkering in your home? Like you have to like tinker and like find different a lot ways. of trial and error like how it takes a while to set up a studio i assume right <laughs> you know yeah i know they don't maybe they don't know i'm okay. i'm still setting up orange studio right? 15 years yeah. later yeah. so yes so yes. it's like a process yeah it's... i completely changed you know i completely changed my entire signal flow a few weeks <laughs> right. ago because right. i had you come over and say what should i do <laughs> right um yeah well, i think that's kind of important to talk to is like you might Somebody might be a musician, but they are on this learning curve, and it's like, you know, if you want to learn to, you guys are where you are because of everyday practice, whatever, but like it is going to take a, some time to make your space perfect for you at that time. Yeah, and then it's, you know, and then as you get better in this, as, as anybody gets better in this, you find, then you discover how that wasn't perfect for you. And then you're like, but I can make it more perfect if dot, dot, dot. Don't ever be afraid to make it more perfect. Don't ever be, you know, don't ever be so committed to, you know, to a certain monitor placement, you know. Be like, oh, like, turns out these monitors have been lying to me for the last two years. I'm going to change how I listen to things. I'm going to change where I listen to things. Um, so, yeah, it is constantly evolving. Um, the one thing that I would say is, um, for home recording, that you can reach a point of diminishing returns, um, when, and, like, if you, if you want to start spending tens and thousands of dollars, you know, on, you know, on sick gear, I am the last person in the world to tell you to not buy cool stuff. Um, but, you know, if, if you're continuously recording in your house and you're like, oh, like, this is going to make it better, if only I had an SSL in my living room, if only I had, you know, um, eventually you just like get to the point where you're just like, hey, you should, like, you have reached the point where you should be talking to somebody in a studio at this point. Um, and so I think that that's really what one should be knowledgeable about is what are my goals with the home record, with the home studio, um, and I, and this is not just because I happen to own a commercial recording studio, but I, 
I love that um, home recording has become as accessible as it has. I don't think that home recording is a replacement for the uh, the modern, you know, the modern uh, standalone recording studio fa uh, recording facilities. I think that it's a great augmenting feature that we have access to, and I think that it is a great new tool in the toolboxes of production to be able to um, to be able to be creative in your home to do a ton of the pre-production work to do a ton of the actual production work um, but if the goal is to modify your house so much that it becomes a commercial recording facility just build a commercial recording facility that makes, that makes a lot of sense and I, I think it's you know, it's interesting because uh, do you still have, do you still record in your home then? You have a little creative space? Um, I actually don't. Okay. Um, I did for the longest time. Yeah. And for me, it became so easy. Yeah. I had, I no longer had, um, the lines were so blurred yeah. between work and home and work and home. And somebody would call me and say, hey, I need this quick revision for this mix. And I would say, okay, I'll go upstairs and do it instead of just saying, I'll do it when I get to the studio tomorrow. Um, and I, you know, I was like, I have a whole studio. Boundary is a studio. Limit. I don't actually need one at home. And so the music that I create at home is kind of for me. I, I have like removed all ability to do most, most commercial work. Well, that's, that's good. I was just thinking like, you know, the way you describe it, like this is, you're building this thing for you to be creative and explore mm -hmm. and build, but then you're taking it to someone who can help you take it all the way. Yeah, and that, I think that yeah. is important. And I think we see that a lot. And we have a lot of super talented recording artists that do stuff at home and then they come to the studio and yeah, I'd you guys say, make it magical. I can speak for myself, but I'm sure you do too. Have You work on a lot of hybrid projects. Oh yeah, a ton. yeah. Yeah. And I get stuff in GarageBand, I get stuff in Logic, I get stuff in Pro Tools, I get, you know, all over the place, and then we have to make it work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I tell, um, and the first thing that came to mind when Bruce approached me about this was um, the, you know, the, like the Billie Eilish situation, that people were like, and you know, well, this record was, you know, like, like Billie Eilish did the, this whole record at home, and she, you know, won all these Grammys, and it was a smash hit. And like, that's that's a, a an awesome myth. It really is an awesome myth. But a ton of the production for that Billie Eilish record was done at home, and then it was uh, then a lot of those vocals were then later on cut in the studio. It was an amazing mix engineer mixing that stuff who was certainly working in, you know, in a professional recording studio, um, a commercial facility. So, yes, like, hit records can be made at home, asterisk, but. Do you guys, um, we're going to open up to the audience, and two things, they're going to give you one more hot tip each before the night ends, so start thinking. Um, okay, and then, um, oh, what was I gonna have? You have two hot tips? Why don't you give us one now? Simplicity. Hot tip. Okay. That's it. Okay, okay. Um. That's a really good one, and I'll, I'll, I'll expand on that after you, you say what you're gonna say. No, no, go ahead, expand, please. I mean, for every, yeah, simplicity. How simple stuff was when I just had a eight track and a 57. Um, or when I was just yelling into some headphones on the left side of a tape. Um, you know, like, when every microphone that you add to the equation, every new signal that you add to the equation, like, I, I tell people that microphones are little electronic ears, and you're placing little electronic ears everywhere, and you're trying to make something sound consistent like it's coming from a space, usually. And the more ears that you have listening to something from different directions, the more it is going to complicate things. I need to take his class. You should take his class. Yeah. Um, 
That's awesome. That's really good. That's good. Um, okay, so you have one more hot tub each later. So later, keep it, yeah. keep it. Okay. Later. Do you do you both work with analog stuff too? You both yeah. stick that. I know yeah. we have stuff, old shit. <laughs> it looks old. Yeah. Yeah. It looks cool. Keep keep and I share uh, yeah. an affinity for old shit. Yeah. yeah. But it costs a lot of money. You got to take it to that Able Audio place all the time. It's so <sighs> yeah. expensive. But um, that's but that's also the kind of cool thing about. You know, you can you can dabble in that too still nowadays. Okay, so they will answer any questions at all, and you can be first. You can go right up to that microphone there. This is like in college when you have like you know, a guest guest. Yes, here we go. Hello. Oh, can you uh, can you say your name yes, and your name favorite is, song? And then my name is Jay London. My favorite song is Thank You, Lady. Uh, which got me in the in the Grammys for the first time. My man, my man, my man. Uh, how important is the relationship between a producer and the engineer? That's a really great question. Um, so I'll answer that question two ways. Um, so more and more with how. So we see budgets of records getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so what, and I'll speak for myself, but I'm sure that the same is true for Keith, that the producer and engineer find themselves as the same person, almost like pretty consistently. Um, but when you have another producer on the project, um, I think that that relationship is really, really important. Because what's great about being an engineer and a producer at the same time is I don't have, like I already speak my own language. I already know what I'm asking myself to do. Um, when I have a producer that is on a couch, you know, 10 feet behind me, um, and he's like trying you have to- have 10 feet between huh? the couch and the control, the, the board? Yes. Damn. Yeah. It's because, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, they, they, well, people like to eat BB Bop and it smells weird, so they, yeah. now, um, So when you have a, a producer that, that's, you know, behind you, and producers um, are, like, especially when they are specifically producers without a lot of the, you know, a lot of the technical uh, vocabulary, um, you'll find them asking for things, you find them asking for emotions. Um, you know, nobody's ever asking for, you know, more, you know, more 12K. They're just like, oh, I just wanted to feel more open. You know what I mean? And so I think that the relationship specifically with communication and vocabulary between a producer and an engineer are really, really important, which is why when you see, like, you watch these, like, videos or you, like, uh, uh, you, like, uh, read the, the stuff that, that like uh, Sweden writes about like when him and Quincy were writing together or were working together and um, and it feels almost like it turns into like you know almost like a playful relationship. Everybody has nicknames for each other. They're like speaking some language that only the two of them quite understand. So I, I think that when there is both a producer and an engineer it's really, really important that they have a good relationship. I totally Totally what he what Joey said, but I, I feel like there's also different types of producers. You know, some who who are like uh, really just more like working with the musicians than the engineer too. And um, what was I going to say with that? But uh, yeah, I feel like there's a um, I was going around to something that you had said. Um, I, I guess it was. It's more of, of the, this idea. I, I guess I'm more more like come back, come from an, like an indie rock uh -huh. yeah. uh, DIY thing in some ways. And like Steve Albini is like one of my favorite engineers, and he will not call himself a producer on his record. It's just recorded by Steve Albini, and so like I really like I, I work with producers a lot. I guess I don't work with too many though. Um, but I feel like the musician needs to be, like, they, they have a stake in this so that, yeah. they, that the musician, in my opinion, no matter what the producer says, <laughs> uh, 
needs to needs to um, be involved quite a bit. Yeah, I agree. I agree. One hundred percent. Awesome. Okay, more. Come on up. Just come on up. You just say your name and your favorite song, and then your question. I, I like being a boss. Yeah, see? Yeah, I feel, I feel like you're putting them on the spot. No, it, it helps It helps break the ice. We're, we're all gonna, like, what <laughs> We're going to start making you defend your favorite song. Oh, man. <laughs> well, yeah. Hi, my name is Jordan. Uh, favorite sure. song, like, of all time? Oh, no, just any song you love. I don't care. Oh, man. I'm in the big room, too. Okay, well, I mean, I, I love a bunch of Vampire Weekends down. I love their song. Yeah. Okay. It's all the ones the first time. Everything I did. That's great. So many okay. good albums. But um, let's say... Yeah, so I'm in a band, and it's we're a guitarist and a drummer, and we both sing. I'm not. I'm in no way interested in trying to take on studios as far as trying to establish a studio that's a that's in the studio business. What I'm interested in is, is it plausible to, for, so not so much for the sake of having a like studio cuts, but for the sake of either live streaming or taking stuff you just did at the home studio and, you know, picking and choosing the highlights you'd want to put on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube and other social media. Is that, is doing that in a way where it's good enough to get past the threshold of, oh, low, the, the low fidelity is an issue with a, with a loud fuzz tone, indie electric guitar, and, and we're trying to get, you know, the vocals and drums, you know, on point, but we're not trying to be the cleanest or the dirtiest sound. But it, where we just want to be just in that space that, that's good enough to be potentially worth hearing to, to perfect strangers, or is that a $1,000 proposition or an $8,000 proposition? That's what I need to know, I guess. Uh, I mean, it, I would say it could be a $1,000 proposition. It could be, it could a, be a $500. Yeah, it, it, could, it, be, it, could, be, yeah, it could be a $100 yeah. proposition. I may just like, need to ask you what to buy after. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, if you want to, like, and again, specifically, and I'll be, like, I'm sure that either one of us would be happy to, like, talk with you specifically for, oh, you're doing this thing, then, you know, you should, you know, solve that problem with X, Y, and Z. But I, I think that it's important, especially, uh, like, you're talking about just putting stuff on TikTok, putting stuff on YouTube. Um, this sort of the rapid fire content creation yeah, that, that's what I'm that that we are you know becoming more and more accustomed to. Um, uh, I wouldn't recommend you know if you called me and said hey like we want this whole production for a 15 second you know TikTok video I'd be like uh, you're crazy you should do this at home um, and just remember that the per the enemy of done is perfect. And like, and so like, when you are like, when you when you're trying to get something out, like you know, like if you like it, there's a chance that somebody else is gonna like it. Well, so oh, that's what I think. I've just been wonder wondering if the fidelity issues would stand in the way. That it, is it gonna is it gonna be so amateur sounding that people come across it and think that's why I'm not. I'm only a little bit interested. I mean, but I I know the counter argument is lo-fi has an indie vibe that is sort of gives you credibility oh. to. You know, so does hip hop, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it, it, yeah. And, and I think over, especially over the pandemic, we saw so much home, so homemade much. stuff that was, that was, um, you know, viral. And so, okay. like, yeah, I, I mean, I think if 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 you get the good basics down and 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 you're able to communicate your emotions through that, then you're good. Yeah, I I, I saw two years where people using the built-in microphone on their MacBook yeah. passed the quality control muster for CNN. So I think you're gonna be all right. <laughs> well, but, but that's just, that's just dialogue, but that's just dialogue. Right, but well, yeah. uh, I don't think they- about live streams. Yeah, 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 yeah okay. I'm not recommending okay. that you use your onboard MacBook speakers or yeah, whatever, yeah. but what I'm saying is that most people aren't, you know, like, yeah, it, you'll be fine. Like, yeah. I think cool. it, in tandem with like your branding and your presence and all. Creative it's, it's director a, right here. I am a creative director. It's all about that, I think, in social. I'm not a musician, but I think that's important. I think that's how you carry yourself through some things. Like that. I didn't know I was going to talk about music today. Okay, come on up. Hi guys, my name's Jeff Tobin. What's up, Jeff? Jeff? Hi there. My favorite song is "Always Look on the Bright Side of Life." And uh, my question is, I'm getting ready to move from a house to a condo. Can I do a proper mix with headphones? There are a lot of tools now for headphones. Yeah. Um, so, yes and. Um, so, I think that, A, there's 
a lot of headphones that are like really re I've heard awesome things about like the Allos that, I, that people are talking about now um, Grados are super great mixing headphones yeah. that I swear by um, I think that the important thing is to um, is to really know your head just like when Keith was talking about uh, you know his reference song you know Karma Police you know, human nature, like, if you know what you're mixing on, like the back of your own hand, then that's not going to be a huge issue. There's always things that kind of don't translate quite as well over headphones, like low end tends to be a weird headphone thing, but I like just go in the car and check it and right, then, exactly. you know, and then adjust accordingly. Um, but just don't listen too loud in the headphones. Yeah. I've been using um, Sonoworks, they make a kind of like you type in, this is the headphones I'm using, brand and model, and it does an EQ adjustment curve, and so like I'm, I was able to mix quite a bit of stuff at home, especially over the pandemic, and so yes, works is awesome. then I, yeah, and then I go into my car and I listen <laughs> yeah. to my speakers in my car. <laughs> so you trust the car probably more than the headphones? I kind of do. I mean, I can't sit there with my laptop in the car and mix. <laughs> I wouldn't want to, but it's a good reference. It's, it's where, like, it's I where know those speakers. Yeah, it's where everybody's most used to listening to music, I yeah. think, is in their cars. And I hate to admit it, now I'll just like throw it on Google Drive or Dropbox yeah, right. and lay it on yeah. my phone. Yeah. And I mean, you have to, just because people do that now, and I think it's awful. I think everyone should buy nice sound systems for their homes and listen to music on good speakers. <laughs> but because it's phone, like though. we right, do all this right. work for for people to just listen to it with these little tiny speakers, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I think the That's main thing is take. just like just not so like not you don't need to be super loud uh, in yeah. your headphones. I, I keep I keep things at a volume that you could be interrupted by somebody coming in the room and asking you a question. Are we looking for? Why be looking for head, headphones that advertise themselves as more balanced? Yeah, you want to. Not beats that have. Yeah, you want to. You you don't want headphones that are made to sound good. You want headphones that are me, made to sound accurate. Right. And uh, and I normally recommend something with an open back or a semi open back if you're going to be using them for mixing. Um, but that's just my own preferences. Yeah, the graders are great. Sony has some good ones. It'd be Sennheiser. so cool if the yeah. names that you know, you know, yeah. Sennheiser, like I, I used to sell drums at the drum shop in town and I'd be like, people would ask me, what kind of used drum set should I buy? I was like, as long as you get like one you've heard of, Ludwig, Tama, Premier, yeah. you know, like all, there's all these companies that made drums for years and we all know them. So like same thing with headphones, all those nice yeah. audio AKGs, companies. AKGs, AKGs, AKGs. Um, and I also plus one to, uh, to Sonarworks. It's a, uh, um, it's an awesome pro like it's it's really really crazy how how well that stuff works for referencing on headphones. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah. You two should have a podcast together about this stuff. Uh oh. That'd be super Where cool. Where are we gonna record it? I know. Right? <laughs> Come back to the door. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Hi. I'm gonna get on my Timmy toes. Uh, my name's Ted. Uh, I don't know. I've been listening to a lot of Henri lately. Okay. Super cool. Uh, so. Basically, my roommates and I have actually started doing live recorded sessions in our house and like putting the whole thing up on YouTube. And so I guess my question really revolves around like we're really focusing on kind of like Tiny Death style whole shoots of bands and we want to really like actually like have all the right equipment and really I think that starts with the sound treating and so ideally where would we start to go ahead and like kind of move down that path? Uh, so going this into this blind, not seeing what your room right. looks like. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, I have to see. Um, I would, I would identify what what the problems of the room were, um, and so you know if, and also not knowing what kind of you know what kind of styles are being recorded in there, um, I. Like I might walk around with a you know a snare drum or something in the room and just like walk around hitting a snare drum and just noticing where it sounds like ass and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and just 
and just be like, okay, and then start, and then, okay, something sounds funky here, I'm going to, like, keep hitting this until I find where this funky thing is coming from, and so, you know, a lot of it will be grabbing, you know, grabbing pieces of absorption, like, making, you know, um, you can go buy, like, a few bats of some, uh, uh, of rock wool at Lowe's right, and yeah. just like frame it up and That's then right. just like, yeah, and then just walk around the room with some rock wool and be like, oh, well that improves it and then walk around the room with the next piece of rock wool and be like, and that improves it even more. Yeah. Um, it's so hard to get specifics when I don't know, you know, the dimensions of the room other than to say, call an, an acoustician and that's right. going to cost a shit ton. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh, when we started building Secret Studio, and um, we were, you know, we only had so much money. And still do. Still only have so much. <laughs> and uh, uh, we got a bunch of foam material from like a friend of a friend that was like... For guns. Something like, some weird <laughs> packaging type material. Tons of it. Right. And, um, and then I hired a friend of mine who used to own a studio, or a I didn't hire him. I asked him to come by, consult, and he. I ended up buying some materials from him. But the first thing he did was he took it and he put it up against his face and he started talking into it. And he realized that he was hearing sound reflecting from it and it wasn't absorbing, and not in a good way the reflection. So like, he's like, "Don't use this." And you, you probably all heard about the the place in Newark that Tectum Tectum that makes uh, you know. We had a Not ton tip. of tectum. Well, it you used to be you could go, it used to be you could go there and like dumpster you know, dive, dumpster dive, when right? But they don't let you do that anymore. Maybe somebody got hurt, right? But we did get a bunch of it, and I mean, really, we're not. We didn't use it. I gave it all away, and so. Um, I use I use very little tectum. Yeah, it. it's great for like gymnasiums. Yeah, you know, to like calm down all those echoes and stuff, but. Uh, it didn't sound that great, and and really, uh, we were concentrating on our isolation booth. It's just a smaller room where we could do like podcast recordings and audio books, and maybe vocals and stuff like that. Um, but and the weirdest thing in that room was that I would walk in there and I would just talk, and I would hear so much low end in my voice, and, and it's like I got to make bass traps, and so like I went to Lowe's, got the rock wool, I made little frames and you know got some bar, uh, burlap and you know covered them and all that and it calmed all of that down and and that in addition to some other absorption materials and diffusion like really made it a good room so there's like again not having seen it not having heard it uh, it's hard to say but um, uh, there's a lot of good online resources too and there's um, on, on Gearspace.com, especially, uh, is it Ethan Weiner? Is that his Ethan, last name? yeah. He writes a lot. He has some PDFs and stuff that you can look out on, on acoustics. Uh, it's a good place to start. And you can uh, you can actually get a, a profile for your room. Oh, right. Not Orlux? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's like, that's super, you know, that's super easy and you don't need to buy their product to get it. Like, I even think... Uh, and, or you can buy, you can usually borrow like, uh, you know, a room tuning mic from some, like an Earthworks or some, some similar microphone and go online and just get a, a, an EQ curve of what your, a visual EQ curve of what your room looks like. And you're like, oh, okay, my, my room is over representing 400 and then start doing, then at least that gives you a problem area. And then it's like, oh, how do I calm down low end in a room or how do I get my room to better represent you know the mids or whatever it is because it's so hard to so hard to give a blanket answer to a room that we haven't seen or heard and and maybe some people might not be familiar with when like we say oh, like yeah. 400 or whatever but like frequency sound you know the frequencies is like I really always recommend to people and my students to like kind of go through an EQ and like listen, like play a song and then like, you know, make a big spike in your EQ program and just kind of like bring it up and hear 
in what frequencies are things popping out and, and, and stuff like that, and starting to learn, you know, uh, you know what 1K sounds like, what 200, what 400 sounds like. Just like those frequencies are like, you can teach yourself that stuff. Um, it's weird, but it's really helpful. Agreed. Cool. Hot tip. Cool. That's a hot tip. Hot Man. tip. I identified one. Thank you. Do Thank we have you. a time check? We're okay right now. Are we good? Okay. They okay. usually have a clock, right? Oh, eight, eight, I didn't eight, even eight, see it. Yeah. It's 8 o'clock. I've played here enough that I okay. know there's a clock right so, here. So, come on up. We got some more questions. You guys just keep them coming. Let's go My name is Callan Foster. Uh, my favorite song, probably Tickets to Ride by the Beatles. Oh, uh, nice. Uh, my question is, so I have already kind of like a home studio and I do some recording, I do some mixing of my own, of my own music. Uh, for reference, the genre is kind of like rock, kind of traditional, like you're miking drums, you're miking a guitar amp. At what point do I consider sending that off to a studio, kind of like you were mentioning hybrid, like when do I have a professional consulting on my mixing? I know you're probably biased. But <laughs> At what, hmm, so, it might be different for everybody. Yeah, you know. so it is, it is, so if you find yourself hitting a ceiling or, you know, uh, with, with what you're doing, then it's probably time to, you know, consult somebody who does this every day, all day, and this is like what they do for a living. Um, and I would also say, and this is to, to piggyback on what Keith said about and yes, I do have a little bit of bias here, but I have I have been on on both sides of this. Um, dentists have their own dentist. Barbers have their own barber. I I I have my own studio. I will not mix my own music. I will not do it. I can't give myself a haircut. Um, and. That's all that I will say without trying to influence one way or another is I do it professionally and I would have Keith mix one of my songs before I mix one of my own songs. Uh, and on top of that, something we haven't really talked about is mastering, which a lot of, maybe a lot of people don't understand. Uh, I guess in, in a very brief way, I'll say that mastering is taking all these different songs that'll be on an album and make them of a piece. Uh, you know, the EQ, the volume levels comparative to each song. They may have all been recorded in the same place at the same weekend or whatever and mixed at the same time, but they all deserve a little different treatment and bring, it's not just bringing the volume up um, for all your mixes to make it all loud. But uh, um, I won't master, I, when, when people come to me and I mix something, I usually say, send it to these three pe one of these three people that I trust because a third set of ears on your own music is super important. Um, I, you know, I'll do it for clients if they really ask, but I would prefer that they go to a dedicated master engineer that has a studio just for that. I, I actually enforce the exact same policy. Like I, I will if they like, if they're pretty insistent on it, but I really prefer not to master my own mixes as well. So I think that Having somebody who specializes in every part of the process makes the process better um, because you're, you know, you know, having having somebody who's really good at everything they do, they do, and especially if it's something that, um, if especially if you're the one performing it, that allows you the freedom to just be the performer and just be the artist, um, as as Keith was saying is know, first 10 years or whatever, uh, recording at home. So I hope that helps. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, hey. my name is James. Hey, James. Uh, my favorite song is Groove is in the Heart. <laughs> yes. Yeah, delight. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask a similar question, but in a different way. Uh, so it's about demos. Demos are almost defined by what's not there. They only get so far, and there's a certain amount that's missing, and we can agree this sounds more like a demo than a finished thing. What you guys say needs to be there in a demo when it's ready to uh, leave the coop, so to speak. Like, when it's ready to be listened to by a professional and then turned into something greater by re-recording, by doing other stuff. 
producing it. A song can live in like s so many different places. You can go so many different places with it. You know, I just want to hear uh, the idea and maybe the emotion behind it. Uh, I want to hear the lyrics, um, and then we can discuss where it's going to go. Because you know, if it's acoustic guitar and vocal, then you know, like. I could totally hear this just being acoustic guitar and vocal on your album, or I could hear this with drums, bass, guitar, string section, <laughs> you know, like just, it just, you know, a, a song to me is, li lives apart from the recording. I don't know if that's... We're so poetic No, tonight. yeah, I think, I like, a good song... Ryan Guy's Truth <laughs> gives me some poetry. A good song is always a good song is always a good song. Like if somebody brings me a, a voice memo as their demo, and it's a great like I know it's a good song. Is is you know, um, I think that uh, the important thing is to um, I would I, I unfortunately am guilty of doing this a ton. I'm going to answer your question with another question, um, which is what do you want the demo to do? Um, like, is this a pre-production demo where we're deciding tempos and arrangements and, you know, and everything that, you know, with the goal of taking this to the studio and being super prepared, is the goal of the demo to, uh, to give it to a producer and say, hey, what do you think? Is the goal of the demo to, to teach it to other people that are going to be in the band to learn the song? So a demo can have, you know, a demonstration of a song can have a whole bunch of goals to it. And I would ask you, what's the goal of the demo? And that will usually dictate the answer. Thank you. I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey guys, I'm Scott. Scott. Um, hey Scott. The greatest song of all time is obviously Surrender by Cheap Trick. Yeah. <laughs> Indisputable. Uh, you answered my question uh, before I asked it about mastering. It sounds like uh, you're for it. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, maybe paying a little bit for it. Plus uh, one for mastering. <laughs> yeah. uh, my trouble spot on home recording is always getting drums to sound how, how I want them to hear in my brain. So if you have any hot tips on how to get the drums you know, sounding how you want to without seven microphones and without, you know, spending We're both drummers, so. Yeah, hot no, tip. Yeah, me too. Um, <laughs> Thanks. So, I get, so, to, again, use the example of your microphones as just ears in the room. Um, stand where the drums sound cool to you. You know, I remember... I remember uh, when I was first when I first started engineering, there was like, like all the talk of like the Glenn Johns, you know, all you know, and I'd see people be like, oh, you need to learn like the Glenn Johns method, blah blah blah. And I remember like you like whatever watching a video of it years ago, and he's just like. I don't know, like it sounded cool over here, so I pointed a microphone at it. It was kind of an accident that yeah. you came up with that and, technique. And I was just like, oh my god, like it, like the hot tip that, you know, hot tip repetition, if you keep it simple and just like, oh, this sounds cool, I think I'm going to record it. And most of the time, something cool happens. Um, I don't know how drums... How, how the drums are sounding in your head. Um, if I could read your mind, I would be getting paid a lot more for this speaking event than I am. Um, but if I, if I did know, like, you know, do you want your drums to sound tight? Because if you want your drums to sound tight, then you, like, put the microphones in a place where you're taking a lot of the room out of the equation. If you... But if you want your sound, drums to sound like big, giant, and open, then you're going to place your microphones where you're, uh, where you have a lot of that room, and hopefully it's a cool-sounding room. Um, the more microphones that you're going to add to it, actually, the harder it's going to get to get your drums to sound the way that you want. And I will also say, hot tip. Hot tip. Hot tip. 
Tune your drums the way that you want them to you sound. You took my hot tip, man. <laughs> um, that was my hot tip. Like the first, like you know, the the first thing in your signal chain is always the instrument that's being performed. So there is no microphone that they make yet that is going to like make a performance better or that is going to make a piano in tune or a guitar in tune. So just tune your drums the way that you want them to sound. If you want your snare to sound a little bit drier, like throw a t-shirt on it. You know, if you want your, you know, you want your kick drum to sound like a little bit more like a cannon, take the front head off, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah, and um, I'll also say that uh, you might find like there's some, you do something that is totally nonsensical, but it works. So experiment, and uh, you know, I some of my favorite drummers never change their heads. You see their snare drum, and it's just like shh, beat to death. But they got a great snare drum sound, and they, you know, uh, uh, so you know, I think this is kind of getting in. I'm starting to go to where my one of my hot tips was is um, we have a lot of great learning tools now, like YouTube and things like that. And I encourage everyone to learn as much as they can, but I also encourage you not to listen to anything they are saying. <laughs> True. Because, uh, you know, there's no rules. There really are no rules. There, There's only um, creativity. I mean, there are rules, and you need to be aware of them. And so you learn as much as you can about acoustics, about miking techniques, but be prepared to find that especially at home, it doesn't work and you have to reinvent that. Yeah. And don't be afraid to trigger samples for your yeah. for your drums. <laughs> yes. Yeah, find find the sample pack of, <laughs> yeah. of, of the drums that are in your head and buy yes. them for forty nine ninety nine and every drum that you ever mix will always sound like that. Um, uh, I, I am guilty of this. <laughs> mixing my own band, which I wish, kind of wish I gave to Joey, and he like, said, screw it, um, triggering a kick drum sample because my kick drum sounds like ass. So, um, and it was played on CD 92.9 all through the pandemic. <laughs> all right. Hey, how's it going? Uh, favorite song, Honey Pie by the Beatles. Yes. Just obsessed with it. Um, do you have any tips for... Uh, hot tips. Think hot tips for acoustic guitar and vocals if you're forced to record in a not ideal space, like hardwood floors, like... Hardwood floors sound cool. Just kind of loose, like, sound coming in from the outside, stuff like that. Treatment is not an option. The occasional gunshot, that kind of thing. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, um, microphones have pickup patterns. Uh, so, you know, on this microphone, it's, it's picking up everything in front of it. Uh, some microphones that will pick up all around it. Some microphones that will pick up on one side, the other side, and reject other sides. Uh, it's bi-directional microphones. So, like, use your microphone pickup patterns to your advantage so you can reject things that might be reflecting off a certain area or something like that. It's kind of where I usually go to, especially if I'm doing vocals and acoustic guitar live at the same time. So a bi-directional microphone, you can aim at your guitar, but the point where it kind of rejects sound, you aim at your voice, you know, and vice versa. So, like, it depends what kind of microphones you have, uh, but that's usually where I go to when I when I think of that. Is that's the first thing I think of. Yeah, I, I again, that goes to my hot tip number one. That uh, sometimes you you purchase a microphone based on what it's not recording, just as much of what it is recording. Yeah. Um, um, but I'll, you know. You're a Beatles fan. I will, you know, I will defer to another, you know, British pop band of the era and just say, let it bleed, man. Like, right. you know, like sometimes, like, so, so you're recording in a room with wood floors. Like, so what? You know, that sounds cool. That's like, a feature. You know, okay. yeah, that's yeah, that's a feature. It's not necessarily a bug. Um, you know, find a place in your room that you're recording that it sounds pleasant to your ear and record it there. And the other thing, you might just need one microphone for that live performance of a vocal and a guitar if it's a live performance if you're not overdubbing. 
you, you may not need to like, oh, I'm going to mic the guitar and mic the voice and stuff like, you know, some of our favorite songs from, you know, the 50s and 60s were just one microphone. Oh, yeah, yeah, a ton. And, you know, like, do you have any microphone recommendations along those lines? Well, yeah, uh, like under five hundred dollars. So my default home yeah. recording desert island microphone. This is like the hot tip. Hot, hot tip. tip. Hot, hot tip. Flaming hot tip. Like flaming hot Cheetos of tips. Because um, that's a question that is asked me all the time. If I could buy one microphone, what would it be? The desert island mic. Um, I recommend for home recording uh, an RE20. I think that it's super versatile, it sounds great, and it's it rejects what you don't want to record, but it's also very forgiving for people that don't have great microphone discipline on things like acoustic guitar, if you happen to be moving around a lot, or you know, if you're Stevie Wonder. Um, so yeah, RE20 is kind of my go-to. So at Musical, we have RE20s. At Secret Studio, we have SM7Bs. Uh -huh. Have you compared the two? I have not because I have I've only used them. I have. Uh, in isolation. I have. I have them both. Uh, I am an RE20 fanboy. Um, I actually do like the rejection of the 7B. So 7B does have a better rejection pattern, I think, than the RE20. But I just I'm a big fan of the tone of RE20. Um, They're great vocal mics. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a Stevie Wonder fanboy, so that also makes me an RE20 yeah. fanboy. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna pick Bruce. up this last one. And this might lead into the next workshop we have. Do you want to go first? Make it short. You guys make it short. No, short. Notice, notice how Bruce holds that, that microphone like yeah. he's like Steven Tyler or something. Right? Hot, hot, hot. Hot tip. Or Bruce Dickinson. I'm Kenny Electro. Favorite song is 3 a.m. Eternal by the Kayla. Hi. And I would say, so my question is, um, how possible is it to, let's say you've got what you think is a finished product, how possible is that to take to, uh, let's say, Music Hall or someplace in Columbus and get it printed on a record? And, and if you can do that, you know, how affordable is that? Like, to do, like, a DIY run of, like, 100 or 200 records? It's one, bit, like, it's... Well, vinyl is weird. Um, all... Yeah, I can try to do something. Yeah, yeah. All the cost is at the front end of that. So um, the first thing they do is is they take the audio and they cut it into a lacquer disc, the grooves. Those are sent off. There's one side, A, side B. Those are sent off to a company that will do all this chemical stuff to create. They'll just, like, layer all this metals on it to make these... Uh, the mother and the, uh, the mother, but eventually they'll make plates to stamp out the records, right? And then they send those back to the pressing plant, and that's where all your money is. Pressing plant, you know, it's like a buck or two a record from there, but all the other cost is at the front end. So whether you're doing 100, 300, or 500 is not a huge difference. What, what, what kind of ballpark are you talking? Um, I always say, go to the musical website. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think I, I actually like, was just looking uh, for a client. I think like, I think a, a run is like of like two hundred and fifty or three hundred records, 300. Uh, something in the in the realm of like thirteen hundred dollars or fourteen hundred. And that's for a black press record in a white paper sleeve, no jackets. I will and I a will, black and white label. I will also, however, um, I I have to and and this will be like. Um, this is specifically for vinyl, and this is actually only, um, and this goes back to Keith's uh, mastering thing. So, um, so the the issue with vinyl, specifically with uh, in a, uh, with home recording or something that might not have been double checked by somebody who does this for a living, is that so. In the process of cutting that vinyl, you are, you know, you are cutting audio waveforms into a piece of lacquer, and audio waveforms um, get the, get wider with volume, and they also get uh, wider with bass frequencies. And so, if you are, if you find yourself in the position, which and 
and I don't want to make uh, any, any assumptions, but I'm going to make one. And that's because every, every person that I've, every uh, recording that I've listened to, almost every recording that I've listened to of new kind of DIY engineers, the low end tends to be the last thing that they're able to manage um, in, a, in, a clean pro in a clean way or control. And when you have too much low end on a master that you are getting, that you are sending to be cut to lacquer, those, and I feel like I might be getting in the weeds here, but uh, those bass frequencies will intersect on the cut, which is going to cause the record to always skip because you're going to have intersecting grooves on that, on that master. And without somebody double checking that, um, and and really, you know, sure, like if it's too loud for Spotify, you turn it down. If it's you know not loud enough for you know, those are all pretty non consequential. But making a record that skips on every copy that is sold is pretty consequential. The cutting engineer knows that though usually. But that's the thing is, is like if you don't have your music mastered specifically for vinyl the cutting engineer is just gonna put it through like the presets. So they're gonna center all the low frequencies so the low frequencies aren't in stereo, which will you know, avoid that inner intersection. Uh, they're gonna do some stuff with the high end so that the, it doesn't distort too much in the high end. And the S's are really pronounced. And uh, you're just kinda going through a cookie cutter process if you're not doing it getting it mixed. I, I Like, if I know a record's getting, gonna be, or if I know something I'm mixing is getting pressed to vinyl, I mix it with that in mind, okay. usually. Um, I don't know, that that's just the way I do it. Uh, but also, definitely, I say, make sure whoever's mastering this knows that it's going to vinyl, because there's, it, it's a physical product, it has physical limitations, and those need to be considered. Thank you. Yeah. You can do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've got so, we're going to have a second um, workshop that's going to kind of feed into the question I'm going to ask these guys now. You're both studio owners, producers, and engineers. How do you deal with actually producing the music? Because, you know, I, I ran AR Capital Records for a lot of years, and I used to say that the records were made outside the studio before going into the studio. So the arrangements and certain songs would be tossed out because they didn't you know, achieve a certain level. So how do you deal with a band that calls up and says, we want to come in and record, and you're tasked with either being that producer engineer or one or the other? So how do you deal with that? So, um, and I'm pretty conscious of this, and I think that everybody who's been doing it long enough it, uh, is aware of it, whether they're conscious of it or not. And so once, especially once the process gets going, um, the song is going to become what the song wants to be. Um, at least that's sort of my process. I just sort of like... The, the song goes where the song wants to go, and that's almost always differently than somebody might have originally thought in their, you know, before coming to the studio, and probably differently than I heard it the first time that I listened to it. Um, songs have, a, you know, songs and records have a way of finding, you know, of telling you what they want to be. Um, and so I think that. Yes, I understand uh, that so, you know, the, the record is made before it comes to the studio. Um, I think that the main thing that somebody like me or somebody like Keith or, you know, is the, the lesson that I wish that I would have learned, a hot tip. Hot tip. The, we, the, the, the lesson that I wish that I would have learned earlier is that the pencil has two ends for a reason. And they are both equally important. And bands tend to, bands and artists tend to be really good at creating with one side of the pencil, not as good at, at editing and erasing with the other side of the pencil. 
And so it is my job as an engineer and a producer to kind of help be the other side of that pencil. Because sometimes ideas just aren't, you know? Like, I've watched plenty of bands, you know, spin their wheels over and over and over for hours, burnt, setting money on fire on an idea that just wasn't good. And they just needed somebody to be like, hey, I listen to music all day. It's kind of what I do for a living. It's just not a good idea. That doesn't mean that you are not good. It just means that this idea isn't working. Well, I'm saying that being in the studio with the clock room, with the meter room, where what you may be saying there may have been more effectively accomplished by sitting in the rehearsal studio. Oh, yeah. Right, sure. I tell... And let's say you put all the songs and say, great, terrible, uh, I, I tell clients all the time when, they're, when it feels like they're writing in the studio, I'm like, you found one of the most expensive couches to sit on to write right. this song. Yeah. Like, you can, go, you can go sit on a park bench for free and do what you're doing right now. Yeah, I, I've, I've had people come in, well, really one in particular in my head, but, uh, you know, I'm going to book four days <laughs> lockout to record two songs because they've had visions of, like, the Beatles and the Beach Boys in the studio, and they... They were romanticizing it, but also felt like, oh, that's the way we have to do it. And, and you know, on day three, when we're recording the bass track again <laughs> um, for the fourth time, um, uh, you know, I, uh, okay, whatever, I throw my hands in the air. But um, I guess, like, from my point of view, you know, you're either going to hire me to be an engineer and, and, and then I'm just recording or you're going to hire me to be an engineer and a producer and then I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'm spending more time on, on the music as well with you and so, you know, I'll go to your rehearsal and, and you know, and offer suggestions on songs and things like that. Great, so, great. Yeah. That's going to lead us basically into the next session which you'll get an advisory on of going into the studio from home recording. Now, the pizza's getting cold. And I want you to all promise that you'll stay here for the Wasteman set. It's excellent. And I want to thank Joey, Keith, and Hot Tip Amy. Hot Tip Amy. Hot Tip Amy.